All right, thank you everyone for waiting. Good afternoon, my name is Carrie Simpson. I am the CEO of Managed Sales Pros. Thank you for joining us today for Tuesday Talking Points. And with me today is Brad Benner, the founder of Next2. Hi, good morning everybody. Brad, next slide please, I'm waiting for you. Yep, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, you know what? I'm wrong. So let's start with some housekeeping. On the right-hand side, you'll see a panel. You can use that panel to enter in any of the questions that you'd like to ask Brad. Uh, go ahead and enter them at any time during the presentation if something strikes a chord with you and you'd like some clarification on it. I'm going to hold all of the questions until the end of the presentation, and then I'll read them out to Brad, and Brad can reply to them. So go ahead and log them in there, but just know that we're going to hold on to them so that we don't interrupt the flow of the presentation. A little bit about Brad. Brad is the founder of Next2. He was previously the owner of a successful MSP that he sold and exited from before founding Next2. Um, and then after he left, or after he sold his MSP, he spent some time traveling the world before settling in Berlin and founding Next2. So Brad, can I expand on that at all? I think that's a great introduction. I appreciate that. Um, if I mute myself, it's because I've got uh, random ambulances driving around in the background. So uh, <laughs> that's what the uh, sound cut out there was for a moment. But uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here um, to be presenting today. This is a topic that um, is near and dear to my heart when I was running my MSP in Seattle. Um, I implemented ConnectWise roughly 2007, and one of the things I was most excited about when I implemented the system was um, the built-in surveys. And I thought, well, finally we're going to have a way to to know what our, how our clients are experiencing the services that we we're providing. Right? We were a small team, really kind of very sort of emotionally invested in the work we were doing and its impact that um, it was having on our client businesses. And um, so we deployed ConnectWise, and we we turn on the built-in surveys, and then we got no responses, right? And it was a bit, you know, it was a, it, it was a big letdown. And so, after I sold my MSP in 2010, I went traveling. And ultimately, ended up here in Berlin, as 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 Kara was mentioning. And I thought, okay, where, you know, what are some of the problems I had as a owner of an MSP um, that I might be able to, you know, make a difference with? And that's ultimately how I came to this topic. So we built a client satisfaction measurement system that. Um, uh, is available with ConnectWise Partners. What I'm going to talk about today is really how to successfully measure and, and client satisfaction, knowing the challenges that, um, that that companies have around this topic, and also drawing on my experience as a um, yeah, as a former owner of of a managed service provider. So let's jump in. And Carrie, feel free to to, to add commentary questions along the way. Otherwise, I'll kind of jump into the slides, and I also look forward to answering the questions that um, you all have as we, uh, as, when, as we get to the end of the presentation. So, um, so let's start with a question, and it, the question is, do your clients consistently and honestly tell you how they experience your services? So, so think about this for a moment, and when I do this live uh, with an audience, I like people to raise their hands, and I can tell you from for most experiences, most audiences, only you know one or two companies in the audience typically will raise their hand and say, "Yeah, I really feel like our clients, uh, you know, honestly and, and consistently tell me, you know, how we're doing." And so the question becomes, um, how, how do you do this in a way that gets people talking? There's a really interesting statistic, which is for every customer who volunteers feedback, there's roughly another 26 others who had a bad experience but don't say anything at all. And this comes to us from the White House Department of Consumer Affairs. So we see these 26 people as 26 missed opportunities. These are 26 people that are out on the street, um, maybe talking about the bad experience, the negative experience they had with your company. And it's also 26 missed opportunities to find out, okay, what happened? What could we have done different? How can we make things better going forward, right? Um, and so you know, the question, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, is how do you find out what your client's experience is? Well, you have to ask, and this may feel like an obvious answer to the question, but it turns out to be a challenging thing to do, right? It's, it's uh, certainly a challenge I faced in my business when I was running it in Seattle. Um, we know that two really interesting things happen when you ask for feedback, right? So the simple ask of, act of asking for feedback 
has both a po generally a positive impact on satisfaction itself, and it also uh, creates more and, and loyal, profitable um, customers over time. So think about that first point, and think about if you if you can remember a time when somebody authentically asked you, how was your experience, right? Maybe it was in a travel setting or with a service provider. I mean, there's lots of settings in our lives where we might have this situation. And, and when they did it in a way that was sort of sincere, how that maybe lifted your spirits a little bit when you maybe had a, a frustrating experience. I certainly have had this experience, right? So, so we know that the simple act of asking for feedback has this positive the uptick on satisfaction itself, um, which I think is a really Im important observation and, 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 and um, starting place for this discussion. So we know that asking for feedback is the first step, but the real challenge is doing it in a way that gets people responding, right? It, it's, it's doing it in a way that gets those 25 out of 26 other people sharing their feedback with you, sharing what their experience is. Um, we know that if response rates to are low, and so when when we say low, we typically consider that sort of in the one to five percent. It re really means that you're hearing only from the outliers, right? So those are typically um, the customers or clients that had either a really great experience or or conversely a really poor experience, and have been motivated enough to share share that experience with you, right? But this is only part of the story. What we really need to do is we really need to hear from all of those people in the middle, right? It's all those other 25 people who really actually are going to be your most important source of feedback, right? Um, they represent the, they, they, they're the ones that fill in the picture. And the, the analogy I always like to use on this point is that if you're looking at a picture, um, uh, right, and you only have a couple pixels to the picture, right? It's uh, you're, it's really hard to to derive meaning. It's hard to know is it, okay, am I looking at a at a rainbow or at a shark or you know at an apple tree? And it's really difficult to know what you're looking at when you really only have one out of 26 pixels, right, showing on the screen. So so hearing from all of those people in the middle bring all the rest of those pixels forward and then you say, oh, okay, I can see what this picture means now. I can actually derive meaning from what I'm seeing and I'm not just seeing these very disparate uh, points of light or points of information, right? So the more responses you get from those people in the middle, the better insight you'll have and not only the better insight but in fact the only really true insight you'll be able to, to get are from those people in the middle. So um, let's just quickly look at some of the reasons why people don't re actually take the time to re respond to a request for feedback, right? And I'm sure these are hopefully going to be familiar. Um, there's many. From our per perspective, there's one most important, and that's attention span, right? And hopefully this rings true with your own experience, I know it does with mine, there's so many things um, competing for our attention. I'm sure everybody's got a mobile device sitting on their desk right now that's blinking and saying, hey, you know, pay attention to me. Um, so this is, uh, we know this from our reality, right? And the thing that's really interesting, uh, interesting statistic, and I always like to ask, you know, and unfortunately we don't have sort of the interactivity of a live audience today, but my question always is, do you know what uh, fish, goldfish have to do with this topic, and um, usually somebody somebody will raise their hand and, and correctly point out that, in fact, goldfish have a longer attention span now than we do as humans, right? So over the last decade and a half, our attention span has dropped from 12 seconds to eight, and it's actually a second less now than uh, than a goldfish. I always sort of um, jokingly say that it'd be interesting to put um, a customer satisfaction survey up against. Uh, the goldfish bowl and see if the goldfish will actually spend more time on the survey than, than we do. Um, but, you know, that's an interesting fact, right? And I think it goes to, um, to underscore the challenge that this really represents, right? The challenge of getting people to take a moment and share with you what their experience has been. Um, but there are other reasons why people also don't respond to surveys, right, respond to requests for feedback. Of course, um, some of these also probably may feel familiar. The surveys are often too long. Um, maybe the questions don't feel relevant. So the things that we're asking as service providers, the questions we think are interesting to us but maybe are not relevant um, to the audience. Maybe we're asking about you know, how well our communication is but the audience or, the, or, or our customers really 
um, keen on talking to us about the consistency of our work, right? So there's a, a, a fundamental mismatch about what we want to, what we're interested in hearing and asking about and what they're really wanting to, to tell us, right? Um, we often see that forms are complicated, um, right? So um, when, when, when given uh, a blank canvas, we find that companies tend to create really complicated <laughs> supports our customer satisfaction surveys, right? So lots of questions, complicated answering scales. Um, I'm sure you've experienced this with a request for feedback. We'll actually look at an example here in a moment. Um, the other piece we often find, and this maybe is a little less obvious, um, but maybe you can think of a moment when, when this has been your experience, but the request for feedback comes too late, right? So there's a fundamental gap between um, or, or a time delay between when you had some sort of interaction with the company and then their subsequent uh, interest or asking for feedback, right? So maybe it's a week later. I find this sometimes, um, I travel a decent amount, so I'll get like a, surveys from hotels that come a day or two after my stay. I'm way more likely to, um, to respond to the ones, I occasionally get them a week or two weeks later. At that point, you know, it's I may have stayed at other hotels since then. I may be back and not in my work mode. I just am generally sort of like, okay, that just feels not relevant to my experience today. And, you know, so I'm, I'm definitely less likely to, to respond. Um, so the basic point here is that if you give people, if you give your audience, your clients, a reason to abandon your survey, they will, right? And uh, think about like the long drive to some destination that you really don't want to be going to and on the way there you pass the theme park or the beach or a thousand other things you'd rather be doing. All of those reasons are the reasons why, you know, th those are the um, reasons to get off the highway, so to say, of, of answering a survey, right? This is, this is a fundamental. So we have to do, you know, so the, 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 um, the, the key is doing, is asking for feedback in a way that actually gets people, you know, responding, the point I've made already. Let's, um, let's actually take a look at sort of what happens when surveys go wrong. Um, also when we kind of, when I do this presentation live, it's, so it was an interesting um, bit of interaction here. And be interesting um, it, to know how many of you, uh, you'll just have to, uh, raise your hand in your office, I won't unfortunately be able to see, but how many of you recognize this uh, survey? So th this is in fact um, the standard support survey that, that ConnectWise sends out. Um, and in fact, this is an older version. Uh, my understanding is that the latest version includes two more questions, right? So let me share with you what I see when I look at this survey. First of all, there's seven, seven questions. You've got a with, with sort of response options. You've got an eighth question, which is the multi-line free-flowing text field. There's a question below that that actually says, would you like you know, us to contact you about the survey? And then you've got the survey response button, right? Um, the first six questions are required, right? So you've got the little asterisks there. And yet the only, what I always find interesting about this particular example is that um, only the first three questions out of all of that, what's going on in that page really relate to um, or I should say the first three or four, relate to the actual interaction that you've had with um, the, the support representative, right? So it's, it's really to ask him, okay, this interaction that you've had, how does that, you know, give us feedback on it? And then the remainder questions are more about um, ConnectWise in general and your relationship and, you know, how would you rate them as a company? And what we find in our experience is that context switch is difficult, right? It actually costs mental energy. So when you're asking people about, the specific interaction, and then you ask them to zoom out and, and think about, um, you know, the relationship in general or as a whole, that that becomes challenging, right? And it, it, it becomes more effort. Um, some of the other things that often come up in discussion, kind of looking at this as a, as a little case study, is um, is the fact that you've got, uh, it's visually convoluted, you've got lots of answers, right? So for the first six questions, you've got these five different answers, which requires, you know, not, not an insignificant amount of thinking. Um, you know, so there's a lot going on here. And these, keep in mind, um, these surveys get sent out for every support ticket, or they're in an ideal world, they would be. Um, so you think about the amount of effort right, that's being asked on, on the part of the recipient, you know, there, there is, this is like a homework, right, it's a, it's a bit of work, it's an extra task that has to be completed, and it's not one that can be completed 
you know, in 30 seconds, for example, you, you could easily spend a, a couple minutes. The one other thing I like to point out about this, um, if you've had a sport interaction with ConnectWise, one of the things that the sport engineers have been making a big effort to do the last year or so is to take, to, before the ticket gets closed, to say, hey, you know, if you really, really appreciate you taking the time to um, fill these support, you know, the survey out. And um, my understanding is that, that the results from this survey um, are actually incorporated into their compensation. So part of their compensation is based on how um, they, you know, the, the responses that we give as, as, as partners um, in this case study to ConnectWise. The thing that I, when I do this presentation live, I always then stop, pause and ask um, the question that I began with at the beginning, which is how many of you consistently and honestly complete these surveys, right? And I'll tell you from, I've done this presentation a couple dozen times now, um, usually there's only one or two people in the audience that are the sort of really great people in the world where they do take the time to um, consistently respond to these surveys, but m the vast majority of people don't. And it's not even um, it's not even that some people sometimes do. It's really like most people, in fact, don't, and there's one or two exceptional individuals um, who do clearly deserve a reward for just being great human beings, <laughs> um, take the time to do this. But the, then, then the question becomes: Okay, well, if if we can see from the audience experience, or or, or you know, the, that that people are not in fact responding to these surveys, what conclusions can a company like ConnectWise, who's uh, you know sending out a survey like this, what conclusions can they draw? And the and the and the reality is is that it's difficult, right? Because it, it gets back into those very few pixel um, situation that we talked about earlier where you have very a very small number of data points and really trying to uh, having the challenge of trying to then make meaning out of that so an interesting case study we'll we'll keep moving here um, so what the the point that I like to make is that a satisfaction survey can't be about or it should not be about what you want to know it's about what your audience wants to tell you right so in the case of in the context of the businesses that we run it's what our clients want to tell us so make it as easy as possible requires as, as little effort as possible for your clients to share this feedback, right? Um, we find, in fact, that one of the most simple and effective ways to get a, lo a, a large amount of consistent, honest feedback from clients is asking one question, right? And this, um, when we started on this topic a year and a half ago, um, you know, this felt very surprising to people. What we are seeing, and I'll show you some some examples here in a moment, that this kind of one question approach is very much becoming a convention. Um, but there's uh, there's some really interesting pieces to it. So let's look at those. Um, so first of all, just a quick review of benefits, right? So one question, um, obviously, it's easy for clients to answer, right? And because it's easy, they will, in fact answer right and so you're, you'll see a dramatic increase in response rates and because of that and that phenomena that we were talking about earlier you'll suddenly have an actionable data set right you'll suddenly have results that are a complete picture that you can start drawing conclusions from that you can start learning from and know and you, and you can do it with the confidence to know okay we are in fact hearing from a representative sample of our clients so we know that this in fact is an issue um, this goes as much for things that you could be doing better as well as where you're having successes, right? Because, you know, not all feedback is going to be innately negative. Um, in fact, what we find with these systems is that when, it's, when, when the system is implemented effectively and you're asking very little of the respondent, the recipient of the survey, that in fact they will take time to um, celebrate the successes and the, and, and the situations that uh, are leading to um, high levels of satisfaction. So that's always a, something to be celebrated as well. So the trick is to ask a question that matters um, and make it count, right? Make it, make it really important. Um, make it maybe one question that, that gets people talking and it's um, about what they want to tell you about. Um, a couple just data points or, or case studies here. So we know from Forbes, for example, that um, shortening uh, surveys can dramatically increase response rates and from our experience we talked about at the beginning that sort of one to five percent response rate um, we have our also seen that within the context of ConnectWise partners go up into the 40 to 60 percent range this directly um, you know is consistent with what what Forbes um, finds on this particular topic um, and let's look at some of these examples I, I alluded to the fact that you know, this has become a convention. Um, I always like at, at this point to be a bit interactive as well, but um, 
the question would always be, you know, do you recognize any of these? Um, we've got sort of two real-world examples. They're actually the same system in different contexts. The one, the, le the leftmost um, with the with sort of the black background, that's um, one of the security um, uh, the, well, satisfaction sort of measurement device that's deployed directly after security at Heathrow in London. Um, I actually had a, got to do a tour last year of, of Terminal 2 at, at Heathrow, and I was talking with the guide and asked him, um, you know, what's their experience with this particular data and what does it mean to them given sort of how the system's been placed, you know, directly after security. He said that what they find, for example, is um, that when satisfaction starts to go down, that they know that that's um, usually indicative of longer wait times through security. So they know in that situation when they start to see a dip in satisfaction to deploy more security agents out to the lines, right? So obviously a different, completely different context, but um, interesting learning that comes from that in terms of that metric and measuring it consistently over time and then you can start to understand, okay, what is what does it mean when the numbers start to change, when they go up and when they go down. A um, couple online examples, these are from various systems that we use. I think all three of the digital examples here are from various um, ticketing, like support case management systems from various um, SaaS applications that we use to run the business. The one in the middle below is from Zero, which is an online accounting system. I forget where these other two came from. But you can all see that it's one question, right? And it's a very um, simple, easy way to respond, um, I think is the, is the key takeaway here. Um, visual aids, uh, also want to point out on this front. So um, visual aids, there are studies to suggest that um, having, so we looked at that ConnectY survey earlier, where it was a question of the number of text-based responses. We know that adding um, visual aids, like smiley faces, for example, dramatically also increase um, the response rates, and I'm, I, I, I assume and I theorize that um, the visual element allows the brain to skip a, a, a mental task, and so that the it's easier to quickly know exactly what response is appropriate for the situation based on whatever the question's asking, right? And as we talked about earlier, anything you can do to re reduce the amount of effort that your recipient is expending, right? That 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 you're asking them to contribute as they respond to the survey. The, the higher you know your response rates are going to be. So key point there. Um, so narrowing down your survey to one question is a, is a good first step. It's one that we found to be super effective for um, the companies we work with. There's other things you can do, and I quickly want to just review those. Um, obviously, reducing the complexity of the of the survey form itself, making sure that it's easy to use, that it's visually easy to navigate is, is a key aspect to that. We looked at that example earlier. Um, I'm always a big proponent of making sure that no fields are required. Um, we like to, again, from this very self-centered perspective, like, well, this, these are all the things that I want to know as, as, a, as a service provider. Well, guess what? It's not about you. It's about the customer, right? And it's kind of a, an idea that we've been exploring this morning. So don't make fields required. Don't ask um, the recipient to respond to a question that they don't that's not relevant to them because if if it's not relevant and you force them to respond, they are very likely to just simply close the browser and move on, right? Um, other things you can do using text that's clear and concise, making, um, and this is a key one, especially today, making sure that any survey is optimized for mobile, right? So that it looks and well and is easy to use on a mobile device. I and mean, think about just the number of tasks that we complete uh, related to email with our with other devices these days. Um, so this is a key element. Another piece is um, ask for only information you don't already know. So for example, um, uh, if you're sending out a survey related to a specific service ticket, well theoretically you should already understand who it's going to and contact information. So you know, only focus on the questions are on, on on the actual experience of the customer, but don't, for example, ask them to enter their name and, and email address again. So this is a common thing that we see. In fact, um, uh, I hate to keep using ConnectWise as an example, but they provided some, some good examples um, related to this topic. They've recently implemented a smiley face survey. Um, perhaps you've seen this. Uh, they call it the Voice of the Customer program. And the thing I always, one of the things that catches my attention is when you click on one of the smiley faces, it immediately goes to a form that asks you for your name and email address again, right? And um, from my perspective, and in fact, the way we built the system that we've built, uh, 
we already know that, right? We know the person who's receiving the survey is connected to the ticket, and so we don't ask the user to enter that information again, right? Um, and obviously, the last point, make sure that your clients know that it's coming from you and it's timely. We talked about that timeliness component earlier. Make sure that, you know, the, the, the request for feedback is, is um, timed in such a way that it's relevant from a, from a time perspective when it, when it reaches the hands of, of the client. Um, a couple things that you should always be doing with client satisfaction data. So assuming you have a system in place, it's, it's, you're not just hearing from those outliers anymore and you're getting good information um, on it consistently back from, from clients. A uh, key element is really directing negative responses for immediate feedback. Um, there's nothing worse or there's no, um, we, we talked about earlier about when you, when you sincerely ask for feedback that that generally will create a slight uptick in um, satisfaction. Well, the most direct way to create an immediate downtick in satisfaction is to not listen to negative responses, right? For those to go into a black hole or those to be perceived as having gone into a black hole, right? So it's really important to direct, you know, to be looking for the sort of negative or neutral responses that come in and handing those off to somebody within the organization that can follow up uh, and take action, right? Listen to what happened, ask questions, be you know inquisitive about okay what happened what could have been different and ultimately then take that information back to the organization and and and, and do something with it right um, you know, we talk a, a lot in the context of client satisfaction systems about sort of this negative feedback and I referenced earlier that in fact there's a lot of, a lot of positivity that comes through so another key element um, is making sure that you're sharing that feedback with your staff right I always find from a staff development perspective that as much as it's important to sort of point out along the way where uh, my staff, my team members could be doing something better, I think it's equally, in fact, and sometimes more important to say, okay, that thing that you did yesterday, that way that you approached that problem, the way that you communicated that out to the team, that was really great. Do more of that, right? So it's not only about uh, dealing with uh, maybe areas for improvement, but really shining the light on the things that are going well, right? Because that's actually equally, it's an it's, it's a, it's a important source of information for staff, staff development. Um, along those lines, when you get positive comments, right, through, through a, a client satisfaction system, it's a golden opportunity to turn those into testimonials, right? So there's, there's no better time from our perspective um, that you could ask a client for, um, you know, when, when they've expressed satisfaction with the delight with the services you provided, ask them, you know, would, would, would it be okay or would you be, be open to the idea of us writing a case study or um, using your comment as a testimonial on our website, right? So that's a key element to these as well. And then, of course, um, you want to obviously use the data that you're gathering to spot trends and figure out where you can improve over time, right? This, a well-implemented client satisfaction system will be a really good yardstick that you can use over time to consistently know how you're doing, what, what's going well, um, and uh, as you make changes and adjust processes and train your staff and do all the other you know, the things that we do within our companies, on a day-by-day -day basis to try to make them better, a, a, a good client satisfaction system will help you then look back and say, okay, we made this change about uh, to a certain you know operating procedure, and let's look back to see how it's actually our clients and did it have the positive effect that we were expecting. So those are some important things to do with the client satisfaction data. Um, so I'll quickly review, and then we can go into Q and A. Um, uh, so you know, as we talked about at the beginning. Asking clients for feedback and doing it in a way that's sincere has this nice uh, positive impact on client satisfaction. It therefore then creates more loyal and profitable clients over time, and it really provides a very rich source of data that you can use um, across the organization to, to have some really profound effects in terms of how you're um, analyzing your service delivery for improvements and also celebrating the successes that you're having as a company. So. I, uh, we can go into Q&A mode. Carrie, I'll hand it back over to you, and then let's, um, yeah, I'm happy to take the discussion for whatever is interesting for, for all of you attendees. Did we lose you, Carrie? I think, let's see here.
You know what? I put myself on mute. I'm back. Hey, yeah, I figured so. Uh, all right. So He's I do back. have some questions for you based on this, and uh, I'll open it up to the audience as well. But one of the first things I thought about at the beginning of your presentation when we were talking about the ease of responding to surveys and the percentage of people that don't tell you what's wrong versus, the, you know, the one out of the, was it 20, one out of 26 will tell you? Yep. So how come people will take time out of their day to write a negative review on a website, like to publicly shame or punish a service provider, but they won't tell the company personally where they fell down or what's going wrong? Like what, is it just like a certain percentage of the population or your client base are complete jerks or is it... Now, what do you think leads to that? Is that a series of frustrations? It seems to me that a one-click survey saying, hey, I'm not happy about this, would be a really easy way to resolve that versus, hey, you know what? I'm so angry that I'm going to take to the website. I'm going to publicly admonish this company for the poor service that I received. What do you think leads to that? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, like, um, you know, as we talked about, you the, when it's not easy and quick and little effort to share feedback, then what you're going to be here, you're going to hear from outliers, right? And you have to think about the situations that get created and the amount of frustration that has to build for that person then to take action, right? And that's, that's there's so much opportunity we've lost, right, up, up until that point when they've gotten that frustrated. Um, I think if you want to look at the psychology of it, I think people feel um, helpless often, right? I know I've certainly felt this many, many times especially with the travel I do where, you know, something happens and I just feel like I get chewed up, you know, and spit out by a machine, you know, a company, not on purpose, but the effect is feels very personal and very frustrating at the time. And, um, you know, I, I think from our perspective, the more that we can do as companies to make it super easy, um, the more that you take the pressure off a situation, you're in, you know, you're in the, and the less like you, you're going to be hearing from those people that are super angry because there's because first of all, there's those data points that are coming in, those there's, there's response survey responses that are coming in that you actually start doing something with, right? And you're not having to then do a post mortem on a really terrible situation um, because you know that's the only one you've heard about, and really you had ten other interactions with that specific client that led up to that, which were increasingly frustrating that you could have taken action about, but you didn't know about. I don't know if that sort of answers your question. But. No, so, I mean, no, I don't think so. any, any, no rational person ends a relationship with a service provider over one poor interaction with them. It's usually a series of smaller issues that leads to a larger frustration. And it seems to me that this one-click survey allows you to quickly mitigate those problems versus allowing it to build and build and build where you end up with somebody who's so frustrated that they're going to take it out publicly. Like it seems Exactly. To, I, yeah, I just absolutely. don't understand why somebody wouldn't pick up the phone and call their service provider and say, hey, really, this is upsetting, we need to solve this, but they will happily go and often anonymously just badmouth you after a poor experience. So. I think one of the, the key takeaways here should be you can head that off at the pass using a solution like this. You can create those more ironclad, bulletproof client relationships just solving small problems as they come up and allowing your clients to easily report those small problems to you instead of just ignoring yeah. that middle ground, right? You've got your... The way I see it, you've got your evangelists, and those are the clients that will walk on nails for you, and they're publicly talking about how great you are, and they're introducing you to people, and they're sending you referrals. Everybody has a handful of those outliers, and then everybody has the you know, clients that perhaps they wish they hadn't onboarded, and eventually the relationship will be over type clients. <laughs> and then somewhere in the middle, you've got this danger zone of clients that might be happy and might not be happy, but they're quiet, so you don't engage with them in the same way that you would engage with those bottom outliers that are always angry about something, or those top outliers who are always so happy. So you've got this kind of, what we call the danger zone here, is are these clients happy? Are they staying? Are they loving you or are they leaving you? And I think that your application really clearly identifies that quickly, easily, and allows for quick resolution. So I hope that everybody that's paying attention today is considering adding a solution like this to their roster. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing I would, I'd say is, like, if you think about the signal that 
our, we as companies send when we ask for feedback and we do it in a way that's very concise and, and makes it easy for the, um, the, you know, the end user, the recipient to respond. Like the, the signal we send is like we're interested and we care, right? And that in and of itself sets the stage for the information that comes back, that interac interaction that follows, right? And I think that's the key is that when you don't send that signal, it's easy for people to say, well, I don't know that they care, or in fact, even have a story in their mind that says, this company doesn't care, they're not asking me, and right, and then you, you, you think of like where people build on that story in their own minds and where mm -hmm. that can lead up to, you know, these sort like of Like personally, I don't need you to solve my problem immediately, but I need you to acknowledge that there is one. I need to be there, there. Like that's what I need as a consumer or a customer. Like yeah. I need somebody, I need one throat to choke, you know, <laughs> like, okay, well, you, you know what, heard, I've got right? it out now, and now mm -hmm. I feel like I've been heard, and I can carry on with my life, and we'll fix this together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have this all the time where it's like, you know, I get in the, uh, you know, I work myself up over something, and the moment they're actually, like, interested in listening, and I feel heard, like, the, just all of the steam from the situation completely dissipates, because, like, oh, okay, I, like, you know, and then I realize, okay, yeah, I was working myself up over this, but, um, yeah, no, I think it's important to be heard, right, and that's a key element to, to this. To well, this I think program. if you don't do the listening, your customers will take the audience out of your control, right? Like, now there's Twitter. The last thing we want is somebody beginning to tweet about the poor service that they're receiving. And I know even myself personally, when I get really heated, I have to step away from social media. I have to just take a moment to think, you know, has every interaction with every customer I've ever had gone perfectly? No. We can probably resolve this in another way. I don't need to tweet to United about how crappy their service was today. I don't need to tweet to this person about, I can just calm down a bit and, you know, but not everyone has that ability all of the time. So I don't know, sure. I just, I love the idea of being able to farm that immediate feedback from our client base. And I know that way, I mean, our, our purpose for having you on today was a little bit selfish. We're launching a new service, so I'd like to take a minute to share on that. Yeah, I think there were some key elements that, that are perfect segue into that program as, as you were sharing some of the details with me. I, you know, I, I shared the feedback with you that really piqued my interest. So I'm definitely interested in hearing more and I think it's definitely relevant to the topic. Um, so yeah, take it away. Thanks. So uh, over the last couple of years, we've done really well outbound calling, cold calling, identifying brand new net new opportunities for our clients. But one of the things that we've noticed is quite often clients are not able to um, to plug the hole in the bottom of the bucket. So they're losing their clients regularly. They're not able to retain them for as long as they would like to. And one of our theories on this is the thing that we've just discussed, which is that, you know, 25 out of 26 of your clients aren't actively sharing with you how they feel about the service that you're providing them with. You know who's really happy and you know who's really unhappy, but do you know who is considering not renewing at the end of their agreement? unless they are actively sharing with you how unhappy they are, you probably don't know what's going to happen in the next one year or two years. And what we've come up with here at Managed Sales Pros is an outbound program that's going to allow us to connect with, client, with our MSP clients' current customers and help them identify who are they in danger of losing and who's really happy. And one of the ways that we thought we would be able to more actively provide that service is to partner with a company like Next2 so that when you get one of those, and I don't know how many people on the webinar today have actually seen the, um, the screenshot of, of what the customer service survey looks like, but there's a smiley face and there's a frowny face. And if you get a frowny face, that frowny face comes immediately to our team for follow-up. So we'll find out right away what went wrong, how can we fix it, is there something bigger happening here than just this one issue, and we'll be able to really quickly stop that issue at the pass, and we'll be able to stop that before you get angry tweets, before you get one-star reviews on Yelp, before you lose that client forever. I think that we can really quickly and easily begin to resolve that problem for our clients. And conversely, 
if you're getting happy faces from your clients, is there an opportunity now to go in there and say, hey, notice that you're really happy with our service. Tell me more about that. We'd like to take our clients' customers through a more extensive customer satisfaction survey. Tell us what you love about us. What could we do better? What would we have to do to risk losing you? Where, like, where are we doing the best job possible? Where could we improve a little bit? And then building on that, if they're super happy, and that's the only time when you should be asking for testimonials is when you know for certain that your clients are super happy, can we write that testimonial for them? Can we create a case study, send that back to our MSP clients to use in their marketing, and then take that one step further? Now that we know 100% that they are happy and they are prepared to share how happy they are, can we collect referrals from that client and begin building a powerful referral network from the people who are the happiest with your service? So that is a brand new service. We're going to be launching that uh, immediately after this webinar, and we're excited to talk to people about it. And we're excited to partner with Next2 to make it easy and simple for clients to provide that feedback. I do have some questions for you now, Brad, from the audience, if you're ready. Absolutely great. Yeah, and I just would quickly comment, like I think um, from our perspective, like the tool that we build and the solution we built does a really good job at what it does. And as I as I was alluding to in, I, in my presentation, it's it's super important that you pair that with processes to actually respond to that feedback. So we're super excited about your offering. We th think it's like a, a perfect complement and really fills in a, an important piece of the overall puzzle, right? So the overall. Um, ingredients that are needed, so to say, for this for, for a company to be successful on this particular front. So I just wanted to comment on that. And yes, I'm happy to take take questions now. Yeah. I think more often than not, our clients are especially our, our smaller MSP clients are engaged in day to day management of their business and supporting the clients that are the noisiest and sometimes the people that aren't making noise get shuffled to the background a little bit and I think partnering with a company like ours to make sure that those customers are being heard is going to solve that problem for companies right you don't have to worry if there's a client fire that needs your attention immediately we got your customer satisfaction handled but so first question is can you use next to if you're using a different PSA? Um, so the answer is unfortunately not today. Our, our, our current primary integrations with ConnectWise, um, I would be super interested in knowing, um, th so let me just first finish my first comment. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, expanding outside of the ConnectWise sphere and, um, and looking at other ticketing systems. Um, there's a couple that come up regularly, like Autotask and TigerPaw are two that, that come up frequently. Um, I would love to hear what um, what particular system you're using so that we could, you know, take that into consideration as we as we look towards the future. So Brad, I can connect you with the person that asked that question immediately after mm -hmm. this webinar, no problem at all. Great. And then one more comment was how could you use Next2 to encourage your team to continue the behavior that you want emulated, how do you provide the report to staff? Well, assuming you've got the data coming in, I think you know what we suggest is um, that you be regularly looking at the responses. And then, for example, within our system, we have this ability to um, tag um, the reaction. So there's a flexible tagging system that you can um, uh, you know, essentially group the the reactions or the, res the the survey responses by theme. So this could work both for things that need corrective action as well as um, items that um, where where you're actually having success. So that's a key piece. Um, we then, for example, within our system, allow um, you could certainly set up logins for the engineers so that they could go in and review their responses. Um, uh, that's, I think, mostly how our partners are sharing with that. We've also got the ability to set up um, email notifications so that when positive responses come in, that those can be routed um, based on the resource. For example, the person that worked on that particular service ticket, or if those, if you want to, for example, direct neutral negative responses to a service manager. So those are some of the ways and tools that um, we see our partners using our particular system to accomplish that. So you can route them, say, to manage sales pros. <laughs> For example, yeah, with, with the offering that you guys are working on, that would be a perfect way to do that, yeah. 
Yeah. So one other thing I wanted to mention is the way that I found out about Next2 was one of our clients was using your solution and they have tied all of their annual performance bonuses to Next2 results, which I thought was really interesting. So what they've done is they, they have a certain amount um, that's allotted for bonuses based on what they achieve every year, and that is distributed based on the next two responses. So the people that are getting the most happy faces are the ones that are receiving a larger share of that end of year bonus. So it's another interesting way that you can engage your entire team in your client satisfaction uh, strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our partners that have really um, taken the implementation of, of our product, for example, our platform to the next level are doing exactly those sorts of things. They're um, setting performance um, targets, right, a certain number of positive responses, for example, and saying, okay, this is the goal, and, you know, there's, um, and then using that to inform some of the compensation. I think from our perspective, it's really important to keep, I mean, it's so easy to get drag down sort of in the negativity or the punitive aspects of these systems and um, we really think that sort of leading with the positivity, so, so leading with like the success that's already being there and then building on that and then helping staff to, to learn how they can improve is a better fundamental approach but we kind of get into different ma management um, styles I guess on that front but yeah, no, absolutely. Now, Brad, have you got a slide here where you can pop up your contact information so that people that are watching that aren't necessarily on the webinar right now can reach out to you um, independently? I know everybody yep. that's on the webinar today will receive um, a follow-up email with contact information. Uh, Brad, are you going to share your slides from the presentation today or will people just have to go download the webinar? Uh, happy to, we can figure out a way to, 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 yeah, we're happy to share the slides, yeah. So if anybody on the webinar today would like to receive a copy of the slides, they can reach out to Brad. His email address is bradb at next.to and his contact information is right there on the screen now. So Brad, maybe just leave that screen up for a minute. Have you got any yep. closing comments that you'd like to share with us today? No, I think, um, you know, if there's no other questions, I, I, I first I guess thank, thank you all for joining us um, this, this morning, this afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, we're super excited about um, working with, uh, with Carrie and her team um, further on this offering. And like, you know, I, I said that sincerely earlier that I think it's a real, it's a very interesting and winning combination, this, the, the capabilities that, that Managed Sales Pros have, has internally in terms of um, doing that outbound reaching and, 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 and uh, customer contact and how that really, I think, fits in with our view of what success looks like when it comes to measuring client satisfaction. So we're super excited about seeing this offering come together and um, yeah, playing our part to, to uh, make it happen. Yeah, we are also very excited about it. One of the things that we've learned over the last year is that 60% of the growth from successful MSPs, so MSPs that are growing year after year who are increasing their monthly recurring revenue, 60% of their growth is coming from within their client base. So it isn't the 40% net new that MSPs should be aggressively focused on quite often. It's that internal, is everybody that we're working with buying everything that we sell and is everyone we're working with renewing? Long-term client growth and retention is what leads to long-term successful managed service providers. The net new is great and we love helping companies find that, but what we'd really like to focus on now is helping you keep it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember that very, very, oh, very acutely from the days that I was running an MSP and it certainly actually is also very much the case these days with the company that I run because we're also subscription based in that, in that sense. So. Yeah, growth from the internal, from the existing client base is, is, a, is a huge opportunity and, and one not to, not to be overlooked. Now, we met with, uh, we were at the HTG peer group meeting. Um, we just missed each other, Brad. I know you were there as well last, uh, yeah. last week and two, two weeks ago in Dallas. And uh, a, an MSP that we know, a good friend of mine, showed up at that meeting having to report to his peer group partners that he'd lost, you know, $20,000 in monthly recurring the week before to a client that they'd had for years. Yeah, that's tough. So, I mean, we'd love to be able to help people prevent that from happening. So, thanks again for joining us today, Brad. Really appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you on the road again soon, maybe in Denver.
Yeah, I don't think Denver's going to happen, but um, we'll, I'm sure we'll cross paths this, <laughs> this year at least, <laughs> if not once, at least twice more. All right. Well, thanks so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday. Take care. Thanks, everybody.